Christmas on our webpage. So today we have a very special webinar. You'll notice that my slides don't say presenter and discussants like they usually do. Instead, we have an interviewee and two interviewers. So I'll explain that in a few minutes, but um, just first let me do some quick introductions. First, I'll introduce myself. I'm Elizabeth. I'm sitting in the World Bank headquarters in Washington, DC. I'm the moderator today and also the task manager for this webinar series. Uh, in the room across the hall, uh, Kristen is sitting at her uh, computer, and she's the one that's actually running the, the webinar. And I hope we have Army sitting somewhere in the building who will come on and help you if you post any problems in the technical chat box. Our interviewees today are uh, Kirsten, and who is sitting in Switzerland, as far as I know, and Louisa, who I assume is sitting somewhere in Britain. And unfortunately, I forgot to put in a slide. I didn't realize that, we, in fact, we're going to have Sean uh, also in Switzerland sitting next to Kirsten, who will be helping to facilitate the question and answer period. And of course, uh, we have Katerina de Albuquerque with us, who I don't actually know where she is. I, she may be in Portugal, or she may be on her travel <laughs> somewhere. Um, but now let's find out a little bit about you. I always like to, to know. I think everybody likes to know where everyone is. I can see some of you have already told us. Uh, Kenneth is there in Utah. If you could just type into the, the chat box. Hi, Gus. We're now, I thank you for your email. We're now linked on LinkedIn. Uh, Bolivia, Rafael from Bolivia again. That's great. Hamilton, is that Hamilton, Canada, I guess? Nairobi, how about Isaleo? Thomas in Paris, Haiti, oh, great. Somebody from Haiti, Vermont, Geneva, Stockholm, Tampa, Dar es Salaam, Paris, Lagos, Hamilton, Canada, indeed. Uh, upstate New York, Calgary, uh, Laura, you are a very faithful webinar uh, participant. Welcome back. Uh, Columbia, Lisbon. Oh, of course, Katharina is sitting in Lisbon. Well, that's the answer to that question. Well, welcome to everybody. Um, Kristen, could you give us our statistics on the webinar series? Sure. Thanks, Liz. We have about 1,281 people registered for our series. And in the room currently, we have about 61 participants. Back to you, Liz. OK, great. Thank you. I'm sure that number of participants is going to rise. We um, usually get people coming in um, over the first 15, 20 minutes to join us. So um, we have a special poll for you today. If you could bring that out, Kristen. Now, this may not make much sense to some of you, but to others of it, you will. It will. Um, there was an e-discussion held on the RWSN D groups chat space. And could you just let us know if you participated in that or not, just out of curiosity? Doesn't doesn't make any difference. You will certainly enjoy today's webinar, whether or not you participated. But it's just a little bit of information. So I see most people didn't participate. Um, but we, oh, it's coming up. Yeah, a few, a few people did. Well, that's great. Um, OK, you can take that uh, poll away, Kristen. And let me um, go on to tell you, just explain a little bit more about the um, the format of today's webinar. Now, um, you all know, I hope at this point, that RWSN is the co-sponsor of this webinar series, along with the the webinar, uh, along with the World Bank. You may also know that RWSN has various working groups that are active on their discussion board, and one of these working groups is on equity and inclusion. Well, the Equity and Inclusion Group ran a three-week e-discussion on the human right to water on their discussion site. And in fact, some of you may have learned about that discussion because we advertised it in our early webinars. And uh, it got quite a number of contributions, quite a few members, as you see from this uh, slide. And in the, during the discussion, the participants discussed particularly about the human right to water and how it affects finance, planning, and implementation of rural water supplies. 
When I read through it, I, I certainly noticed that some issues came up repeatedly in, to, in the discussion, but I won't go into the content of the e-discussion at all, because that, of course, is what this webinar is for. Uh, Louisa and Kirsten, who organized this wonderful discussion, are going to pose six questions to Katerina, covering some of the most frequent topics. And Katerina will then uh, respond to these. So um, let me give you a, a, a more in-depth introduction to Louisa, Kirsten, and Katerina, and then turn the microphone over to them so we can get started. Um, I have to turn the pages of my uh, notes here to find out. Um, Kirsten. Kirsten was originally a mechanical engineer who did her PhD research on technology in uptake and manual drilling in Uganda. She lived in Uganda for 10 years, working with civil society organizations, the private sector, and the Uganda Water and Sanitation NGO Network. For five years, she was the engineering advisor for the rural water supply and sanitation to in the Ministry of Water and Environment in Uganda. I used to work there, too. As part of this, she was involved in developing the Uganda Sector Performance Measurement Framework. She has also worked in Malawi, Niger, Ethiopia, and Ghana. Her focus of research over the years is cost-effective borehole drilling and sustainability aspects of rural water supplies. Kirsten took over the lead of the Rural Water Supply Network Sec Secretariat in Switzerland in 2009. And of course, all of you know Kirsten because she has been a faithful organizer and facilitator of this webinar from the beginning. Louisa Gosling has worked in international development for over 20 years and at WaterAid since 2009. Her focus is on mainstreaming equity and inclusion, intrinsic to a rights-based approach. She is also collaborating with RWSN and the WSSCC in their efforts to promote equity and inclusion in the WASH sector. And of course, together, the both of them ran the e-discussion. Katarina de Albuquerque is the first UN special rapporteur on the right to safe water drinking, a right to safe drinking water and sanitation. She was appointed by the Human Rights Council in September 2008. Between 2004 and 2008, she presided over the negotiations of the optional protocol to the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which the UN General Assembly approved by consensus on 10 December 2008. So we're very lucky to have these people with us. And with that, I will turn the microphone over to Louisa. If you could take away my uh, slides, Kristen, and bring out Louisa's. Thank you. Over to you, Louisa. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, well, it's a great um, uh, uh, privilege to be here in this webinar. Um, I'm going to, um, as Elizabeth said, this it, this is the, the final stage of a um, an e discussion in um, on the implications of the implementation of the human right to water. Um, I want to start with a quote from Yakuba Kaigama from SNV in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This was a quote that came up as part of the e discussion, and he writes. The human right to water does not result in immediate access. This is a lengthy process. All the rights which we are currently used to, such as holiday pay, women's work, minimum wage, and even simply to live, were the subject of bitter labor negotiations and sometimes difficult social and political struggles. At first, they seemed like a utopia. Many were skeptical of their feasibility, and yet some of these rights have become a reality, even in poor countries. It is important to set a framework for social and political negotiations, to be political, and to speak. We also note from another discussant who's been very active on this discussion, Virginia Rowe, that the human right to water is an extra tool of legal, analytical, political, and promotional nature, rather than a replacement approach. And it provides an opportunity to democratize the debate, in the words of Omar Samake. 
from Mali. So far, the guidance on the right to water and most of what has been written and spoken about on the right to water seems to have focused in two places on, at the top level in terms of government policies and laws and again and secondly on the role of citizens in claiming their rights. The grey area which needs to be addressed and which we would like this discussion to address is really on how this applies to those directly responsible for implementation and the sustainability of services. This is the concern that ran through the dialogue of the e-discussions and we used the issues and suggestions raised during the discussion to formulate the six questions for Katerina. So I'm now going to, as we have, we'll have a lot to discuss and after we've uh, asked these six questions and invited Katerina to respond, there'll be an opportunity for everyone in the room to also have their questions um, addressed by Katerina as much as we have time for. So the first question I'm going to ask is, what are the rights and the responsibilities of citizens with respect to the human right to safe drinking water? Katerina. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Louisa, and thanks uh, to all for for attending. It's it's a pleasure uh, to be here and and address you. Um, the the rights um, uh, to to water and sanitation uh, provide legal standards. Legal standards that do not have to be achieved overnight, as Louisa, you were saying, uh, with the quotation that you that you just uh, read out. They have to be achieved progressively, um, which means that states have to take deliberate steps. They have to have a plan. They have to have a vision in order to achieve water and sanitation for all without discrimination. The component of non-discrimination is very important because it tells us that we have to target the poor, we have to target the most vulnerable, those who have been forgotten uh, and those who didn't manage to get access up until now. So the, 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 the standard, this human rights standard can be explained in terms of five essential components. Availability, quality, acceptability, accessibility, and affordability. You can see it on the slides. When it comes to availability, what the human rights standard says is that people have the right to get an, an amount of water which, uh, and a number of uh, sanitation facilities that is sufficient for personal and domestic uses. This does not cover, as many people um, sometimes say, well, also in a provocative manner, this does not cover the water for the swimming pool. No, it's, it doesn't. Neither the water for the golf course. It covers drinking, it covers cooking, and it covers personal hygiene. When it comes to quality, obviously, this is clear for all. Water has to be safe to drink, to use, uh, for cleansing, for hand washing, and sanitation facilities must uh, be um, hygienically and technically safe to, to use. Uh, human excreta has, uh, excreta has to be um, separated from human contact, animal contact, insect contact, etc. Acceptability. Uh, acceptability comes a little bit more into play when we talk about sanitation, uh, meaning that the, the facilities have to be culturally acceptable, have to ensure privacy, and this uh, dimension of dignity is also addressed under uh, acceptability. Um, under accessibility, uh, it, it, this means that water and sanitation have to be available to everyone within the household or in its uh, vicinity. It also means that water and sanitation should be available in all spheres of a person's life which means let's go, let's think beyond the household and also try to capture schools, workplaces, etc. These all far form uh, uh, the human rights uh, to water and sanitation. And finally, affordability, meaning um, that um, people uh, cannot be forced to make what I call impossible choices, meaning they, as people that I have met in my missions, meaning that people should not be forced to choose between paying the water bill or the pharmacy bill, the water bill or the food bill. Water has to be has to have a reasonable price, which is not the same as to say that it should be um, uh, for free. The state, as I was saying, has obligations, uh, and people, like all of us, have duties not to harm other people's rights. 
for example, by using the sanitation. Um, we all, people are also encouraged uh, and should participate uh, in order to make sure that the solutions that are found are closest, closer to their, uh, to, their, to their needs. And obviously, uh, water users and water providers have to incorporate human rights in their water supply management to ensure access to all. Uh, in the question, uh, there was a, ref a reference to citizens to the rights of citizens. And I would like to say that human rights are not just for citizens, but for everyone, including for people who have no citizenship, for migrants, for refugees, uh, etc. I finished. Thank you very much, Katrina. That's um, very useful. Let's go on to the second question. Can you explain the importance of embedding the human rights to water in national legislation? And what can be done in countries where there is not an enabling environment for human rights? Um, thank you, Kirsten. Uh, the second question is a especially tricky one. I'll start with the first. Um, States are obliged, they are legally obliged to dom domesticate their international obligations, international laws, policies, programs, plans of action, uh, uh, at the national, in, at the national uh, well, nationally. Um, so, um, including, uh, for example, the right to water, international constitutions, or even in ordinary laws, ensures more stability. Why does it ensure more stability? It's not only an obligation, but it also has advantages, because um, WASH becomes hard law, and not only a good invention that can come and go according to, to, to political will and to changes in governments, but it also makes sure, by being in the law, that governments and providers and other actors and other stakeholders are bound, are legally bound to making sure that this right becomes a reality. And of course, if it is a legal obligation, in cases of disrespect, there are obviously, obviously uh, consequences. So there is this element of stability, stability in terms of political changes in a country, and also stability because people know this is the law and they know that they can hold their government accountable in case where they are not complying with their obligations. Now, regarding the second question, as I said, this it's not an easy, it's not an easy, nor a straightforward uh, answer. I always ask myself very often that answer, and when I pick up countries where to go on country missions, I, I also try to think about those countries where the human rights environment, the enabling environment, is not as good, uh, because I see, and this is the answer that I can bring to you today, because I see that water and sanitation can open doors uh, for uh, enforcing human rights, these human rights for water and sanitation, but also other uh, human rights uh, 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 more broadly. Uh, in that context, um, the lack of enabling environment can change, I think, with the support from uh, the international community, which is, well, a very vague concept, uh, but also, and I, I think about UNICEF, for example, in the field, UNICEF offices and other UN offices, also the World Bank, to bring certain issues to uh, the table, um, uh, promote uh, participation uh, of, uh, of including of women, of, of, of those who are benefiting from interventions. I think it's very important to start changing the atmosphere in the country. And obviously national NGOs have a very crucial, uh, crucial, crucial, crucial role to play. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina. Um, our third question, which is not any easier, I don't think, is how can rights make a difference when it comes to implementation? This means to the financial resources as well as the management and technical capacity that is needed to achieve sustainable water and sanitation for all. Uh, thank you, Louisa. Um, well, as I was saying before, 
um, human rights set an obligation of progressive realization. And the norm uh, that of an international treaty, which is the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which, which sets um, this uh, obligation of progressive realization also determines that countries are obliged to use uh, the maximum of their available resources. Their available resources, if we are talking about the developing country, means, uh, means, 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 uh, resources available from at the national level, but also resources coming from international uh, cooperation. Um, of course, this is easy to say, it's more difficult to implement because of course water and sanitation are not the only human right that states have to realize. Um, so there will be competing demands at the national level between water sanitation, education, uh, health, uh, etc. Um, so of course it's up to the government to make sure that um, there are no rights that are neglected and it's up to the government to decide on priorities, on how to prioritize the allocation of these scarce resources, but also, very importantly, developing governments, are, developing states are under an obligation to request, to seek international cooperation and assistance if the, the resources, the national resources that they have available are not enough to uh, progressively realize the right to water and sanitation. And I'm now sticking to water and sanitation because that's the subject of today's discussion. And of course, Human rights determine that we have to prioritize those who are unserved and underserved. And this is a significant difference between the human rights approach and the approach uh, which is defined by in the framework of the Millennium Development Goals. Um, when I talk about the obligation of progressive realization, there is a flip side to this uh, obligation, which is a prohibition of retrogressive measures, which means uh, the, vision, uh, 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 the vision of human rights is that states will constantly take steps to achieve higher rates of coverage, higher rates, higher, bigger numbers of people who will get access to safe drinking water and, and, and sanitation. So in principle, any step backwards is to be seen as a violation of human rights. Of course, uh, it does not have to be a violation of human rights, uh, because there can be circumstances in which this retrogressive step can be justified. I will give you an example. In the case of natural disaster, of course, there will be a retrogressive step, and this is justified. In case of a financial crisis, where uh, a country has less resources available, this can be justified. Of course, it would be then important to look at the, 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 the government's, um, at the state uh, budget and see how the, the, the government in their particular, particularly difficult situation is still prioritizing human rights. Where, uh, where is the money going to? That's also something interesting to, to, to do. Uh, and of course, when we look at implementation, I think it's crucial to look at the sector holistically and to understand the need for example, for training, to sustain progress. Um, for example, by focusing on increasing technical capacity, and I've seen that in countries. So one crucial element is maintenance. Uh, in order for, for countries not to take retrogressive, retrogressive uh, steps and for states not to be, well, possibly uh, uh, violating uh, the human rights to, to, to water and sanitation. Uh, back to you, I think now it's Kirsten. Thank you very much for that comprehensive overview. Um, I don't think you can get it much more comprehensive and condensed. Let me go to the fourth question. We have six questions, so very soon we're going to come to all of your questions in the chat box. But Katerina, could you tell us more about existing and new mechanisms for accountability with respect to the progressive realization of the human right to water? Over to you. Uh, thanks, Kirsten. Uh, well, uh, when it comes to accountability, I think it's important to say um, that human rights accept, and I think we even encourage, uh, different ways of implementing the human right to water and sanitation. There is no one-size-fits-all solution 
when it comes to the realization of this right. Uh, there are, as we put on the slide, there are many different ways to get there. And um, I launched uh, at Marseille, some of you I see, <laughs> uh, uh, people, many people I know uh, participating in uh, today's webinar. I launched a book uh, which is available on my website, uh, uh, which is a compilation of good practices mm -hmm. in, uh, in the realization of the human rights to water and sanitation. And I think that compilation shows the diversity mm -hmm. of ways uh, to implement this human right. And all of them are good to making sure that we get there. So I would say that sky is the limit and um, good imagination is an asset. Um, so back to accountability and let me di divide it, uh, distinguish different levels. For example, at the international level, um, you can bring complaints. You can bring uh, complaints either to me, to my mandate, and I'll, I'll type here my, 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 uh, my email address, my mandate email address. I receive complaints from alleged victims of my violations of the rights to water and sanitation. Number one. Number two, I also undertake fact-finding missions. I undertake three fact-finding missions uh, per year. And when I go on mission, at the invitation of the government, this is imp very important to say, I cannot choose any country I want. I, I express an interest to go to a certain country, and then the, the government, the respective government, might or might not invite me. So when I go to the to the to the certain to, to a certain country, I meet with the government, obviously, uh, to listen to the official uh, story and uh, the official uh, uh, information regarding the, the measures they are taking to make sure that these rights become a reality. But then I also meet with NGOs, and uh, very often I receive lots of complaints. Uh, I receive lots of complaints. There mm. is, there are also UN treaty monitoring bodies which can also receive complaints. I will not go into uh, 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 great length uh, uh, on these issues. Then, closer to people, you have the national accountability mechanisms. For example, uh, does your country have a national independent regulator for water uh, and sanitation? Does your country have an independent national human rights institution? Uh, um, so I would say primarily uh, these would be the adequate entities um, for you to present complaints in cases of alleged violations of the rights. Um, you can also go to courts, but we know that going to court costs money and it costs time. But of course, you can also and should also bring uh, compliance to your service providers. Um, I think that uh, 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 it is very important to bring the human rights framework. Uh, the uh, right to water and sanitation is binding. It's binding on all countries in the world. So I think that bringing this this concept of the human rights, plus the elements that I mentioned before, uh, before a national uh, regulator or a national independent human rights institution can be very powerful for, for your rights to be, for you to claim your rights and for, um, for adjudication uh, uh, on, 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 uh, on these rights. So, uh, the normative uh, standards that I mentioned provi provide a common accountability framework which can be used at different levels. Rather, I was, I was mentioning the international level, the national level, the local level, etc. Uh, and it can be, uh, and uh, as I was saying, you should apply it. Uh, those of you who work uh, no. with civil society uh, organizations to hold providers to account for it. Uh, and uh, of course, it would be important for NGOs, and I've seen this in some of the country missions that I undertook, and uh, that NGOs uh, support and inform poor, poor people, helping them to uh, hold providers to account, the government to account, um, etc. Uh, I think that's all for the time uh, uh, being. Thank you very much, Katerina. Um, the fifth question is, what are the rights, we've talked about um, governments and civil society and, 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 and people, what about the rights and responsibilities of the private sector within the human right to water? Uh, thank you, Louisa. Uh, I'll move forward the slide. Um, well, I think it, there is a common misunderstanding when we talk about the rights uh, to water and, and, and sanitation. Maybe it also happens to other rights, uh, but I think it's, pre it's exceptionally extreme when we talk especially about the right to water. Uh, 
uh, and which is the fact that if water is to be considered a human right, then the private sector cannot participate. Then water has to be for free. We have seen that well, water has not to be given for free; that it has only to, that it has to be affordable. Now, regarding the form of service provision, human rights are agnostic. I always give the example of other human rights as the right to food, and I always say that when people go to the supermarket, they have to pay the bill or to a restaurant, and, and food is of course also a human right. So the important thing is that even or no matter the form of service provision that is chosen in a certain country or a certain region, that this element, the element that I mentioned at the beginning of this chat, um, uh, the element that uh, uh, are the component elements of the human right to water and sanitation, that these um, that these uh, elements are. Uh, complied with, that these elements are um, uh, respected. Um, when it comes to the private sector, the private sector has obviously responsibilities. The human right, the normative content of the right has to be applied. They, they have to respect um, human rights. They have to respect the principle of non-discrimination, which is obviously part of the principle of, 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 of respecting human rights. They have an obligation to do no harm. And they have to, uh, and then of course, due diligence applies obviously also to the private sector. Uh, the, the private sector, uh, the main obligation stays obviously with the government. It is the government that has to regulate uh, the sector and establish certain rules, certain principles that will apply also to the private sector. So if the private sector wants to do business, and if obviously this is not contrary to the national legislation, the national constitution, etc., then the government has to ensure, for example, uh, that uh, uh, the poor people are not excluded, that water is of quality, that, uh, that there is a maximum price that can be charged to people to make sure that, that uh, the services are uh, affordable. Um, I believe, and I've seen this in certain countries in the world, that there are smart ways to make sure that the system is economically attractive and simultaneously that the tariffs are um, affordable. Obviously, uh, and to finish, the financial sustainability of the system should not be at the expense of human rights, namely the principle of affordability. Um, state and donors have an obligation to support the most excluded. So if you, if the government uh, reaches the conclusion that uh, the provision of water, for example, by the private sector or also by the public sector, it doesn't matter uh, for that purpose, if it is not affordable uh, to, to, a, to, a, to a part of the population, then the government has to make the adopt measures to subsidize the water, to help certain families, whatever, to make sure that nobody is excluded just because he, she does not have the uh, necessary uh, financial needs. Um, back to, I think. Thank you, Catherine. We, we can sometimes hear some very interesting noises in the background, and I think maybe you share an office with some colleagues who may be killing flies now and again. So it would be nice just if you could ask them to be a little bit quiet, because we can hear everything behind you. Sorry. Right, let me go on to question six. Okay, what does the human right to water actually mean in terms of the quantity of water, the quality, sustainability, and what's the time frame to realize this right? Over to you, Katerina. Hi, Katerina, I think you need to put your microphone off mute because we can't hear you at all now. No, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, That's sorry great. I forgot. I was concerned. Now, when it comes to quantity, yes. human yes. rights do not set yes. a certain quantity, a certain yes. amount of water uh, or sanitation uh, for that purpose uh, for every single person. But what is important is that the quantity of water available is enough 
for people to be able to drink, to cook, and for their personal and domestic hygiene. Of course, this can be different in different contexts. For different people, um, a, a, man, a, a woman who is menstruating has a different need of water than another person. You can, you might need more water in a warm country than in a in a cold country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this will change from place to place, from region to region, from person to person. What is important is that the water uh, in question is enough for people to drink, to cook, and for personal hygiene. When it comes to quality. Um, well, this is obviously a, a crucial criterion, which is not currently in the proxy indicators for the MDG targets. Um, so, and it is important to say that human rights focus on quality, and this is one of my many expectations for the post-2015 uh, development agenda. When it comes to sustainability, there is an obligation of progressive realization, and as I said, any retrogressive steps without justification, as I said, are in principle a uh, uh, violation of the human rights. Regarding the time frame, this will depend from country to country. Uh, of course, a country where 50% of the population does not have access to water will need more time to get there. Uh, a, a country where there is only 1,000 people without access needs less time. What is important is that the country set a national strategy uh, to get there and proceed to take targeted steps with uh, the help of international cooperation when, when necessary. What is important is to set the priorities right. I mean, start with a minimum core obligation. Start by giving a minimum level of access to those who still don't have access, who are not served, underserved. So a minimum access to everyone before you move forward and you reach the low hanging fruits. Okay, well, thank you very Thanks. much. Uh, yeah, Kirsten and, no, wait a minute, Kristen. We've got a Kirsten and a Kristen, and of course, I always say the wrong one. Kristen, could you please take away these slides and bring out our um, the remaining slides? Thank you. So now um, I'll once again, that was um, uh, a great, interview you had. I've unfortunately made a mistake on this slide because Sean, our very loyal facilitator, Sean, has also been working terribly hard behind the scenes to arrange questions. So if you could now, Kristen, bring out the question and answer box, I will once again turn over to uh, Sean and Kirsten and Louisa and let them run this section of the webinar. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. And, and we've been told that Katerina has somebody installing a new computer quietly in the corner of her office. So, so please, um, just bear with them. They're trying to be as quiet as possible. OK, Katerina, we have a first question um, for you from Mark Detman around data. And what he asks is, how can we collect data to measure discrimination at household level? For example, to capture intra-household intra gender discrimination, as one example. Over to you, Katerina. Uh, thanks, Kirsten. Um, well, you know that in the framework of the post development agenda and uh, and looking uh, at possible new goals. Okay, sorry, Katerina, we can't we can't hear you very well. Could you just talk more closely to the microphone? Your sound is a little bit low. Sorry. Now, is it good now? Is it good? Hello. I'm not sure what's happened. It's not as clear as it was, so no. something maybe changed. Maybe just talk a little bit louder. <laughs> I didn't move. Is that okay now? Hello? That's that's better. That's better. Keep it like that. Okay, yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So what I was saying was that um, as you know, uh, there is work being undertaken in order to see how we can improve. Um, uh, uh, the measurement and monitoring of uh, water and sanitation after 2000, uh, 2015. So when the world comes together and agrees on a new development agenda for after 2015, we, the water and sanitation sector, want to be ready uh, with new uh, uh, tools. We want to be ready to monitor whatever is 
decided that one by And one of the things, as you might know, there, uh, the, there have been four working groups established to look at, it, at, at monitoring for water, uh, sanitation, and hygiene. And there is a fourth working group, which uh, I am happy to chair, which is a working group on equity and on discrimination. And uh, what are we doing? And uh, for example, we are like, a member of this working group. Uh, we were working last week here in Lisbon. Uh, so what the working group is doing is precisely trying to see how we can manage um, to uh, to get data uh, on discrimination or uh, to measure discrimination at the household uh, level. Well, we have not yet come to a final agreement. Not, well, we are part yet I think, of the final agreement. But one of the things we thought about was, um, for example, to uh, target questions only at women, uh, had a set of questions for men, but also a set of questions just for women, and address the issue of actual use and not just availability, for example, of sanitation in the, in the, in, in the house, and uh, address questions uh, related to natural hygiene management. Uh, because we think this can also possibly be a proxy indicator uh, of wider, uh, uh, wider discrimination. We were also thinking about um, uh, looking at access to water, but also sanitation outside the house. Is it available in the school? And if not, what can it tell us about wider patterns of discrimination, for example, uh, uh, against students? So I, I encourage you to go to the JMP's website on the internet, and um, there are the reports of the working groups are there, and you can also you can already start seeing what are the proposals that have been put in the table, and you are mostly encouraged to also make suggestions, recommendations to any of these four uh, uh, working groups. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Katharina. Um, thank you for, again for your, your presentation and answers to your questions. Um, it sounds like there's someone tap dancing on a keyboard near you. Um, if you can let them let know that uh, they should go and do their uh, their, their entertainment elsewhere. Um, but w the the next set of questions are around motivating governments. So uh, Mabida Dibeli asks, why are so many national governments frequently violating uh, their rights? And uh, Fatoumata uh, adds this by saying, how can we motivate Political will for the right uh, for safe drinking water and sanitation, and uh, following on to that, uh, about how we can encourage developing countries to respect the right to life, health, and what kind of incentive is vital. Thank you. Over to you. Good. Um, why so many governments are making the right to water? Well, because um, there is there is a simple answer to your question. Um, what I think is that very often what I see is that poor people are uh, invisible and are irrelevant uh, to, uh, to, uh, to politicians and the people living in slums. Uh, in one of the countries I visited, I was mentioning the uh, I was mentioning what I had seen in slums and the the, the, the answer I got was. I'm afraid I'm going to, yeah. sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you. We're finding it very difficult to hear you. I don't know if there's a way you could come much more closely to the mic, um, but we're really struggling to hear you now. So sorry about that. I don't know what to do. Are you maybe to come very because you were it was fine at the beginning so maybe to come a little bit more closer to the mic somehow as close as you can <laughs> because we want to hear you. We have, yeah. Maybe move the mic if I had a little bit closer. Or just speak even more loudly, because it's the, the sound quality is not great. Sorry. Okay. Over to you. Good. Um, OK. Um, so now I, 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 uh, uh, why do governments violate their rights? Yes, because I think that there are people who are invisible in countries. Uh, and who are seen as less important than others, and who are not a priority for uh, politicians. And that's why uh, politicians do not focus their uh, budget allocations, their political priorities on these people. Um, people who are living in remote rural areas, people who are living in, uh, in slums, 
people who don't count, people who belong to groups, to minorities who are stigmatized. My next report to the Human Rights Council will be on stigma. People who are stigmatized, people that governments don't care about again, like uh, the Dalits, like the Roma, like the homeless, like uh, the slum dwellers, etc. So it's not a political priority. And um, I think how we can m motivate political will for, for, for the right to water and sanitation while talking about it. Talking about it, it's, 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 and, and writing about it, and, um, and, um, and explaining government that uh, this is not an option, it's an obligation. Um, making sure that we hold them accountable. Uh, making sure that they know what they have committed to when uh, supporting uh, the resolution by the General Assembly that they can recognize water and sanitation as a human right. This means it's binding, we have to do it now. Uh, otherwise, there will be consequences. Show them the consequences. Present complaints. Present move things at the national level, but also at the international level. Uh, now, regarding the last, uh, uh, and of course, I think that regarding the last question on the slide, I think it's important for people to understand, and also governments to understand, that investing in water and sanitation is actually a smart choice. It's a smart investment. Um, they will gain a lot. Uh, by doing it, they will save money, they will save lives, etc., uh, etc. Et and I think that a lot comes by sensitizing and uh, doing some awareness raising among among um, uh, politicians. I think that, for example, I was last year in DC, last month, sorry, in DC for sanitation and water for all, and I was truly impressed by the fact that so many finance ministers, so many sector ministers. Uh, the deputy, the future deputy, Secretary General of the UN, the Prince of the Netherlands, they were all there uh, talking about uh, uh, what they want to do uh, uh, to implement the right to water and sanitation, and there are commitments in the outcome document regarding uh, this human right. So I think it's a process, it's a walk, it's a long walk. Um, but we have to start it, or we have to continue it, and uh, well, maybe the steps are small, and maybe we are unsatisfied at the small steps, maybe we are impatient, I'm sure, I surely am impatient, but um, I think this is only the way to, to, to go, to continue doing it. Thank you. I think I... I, I... Thank you very much. Um... While I'm posing the next question, it might be useful for you to turn your microphone volume up a little bit, as we did in the training, just because people are still struggling to hear. But that is much, much better in terms of sound. Um, let me go on to the next question. Um, and we've got loads of questions coming in, so and we've got plenty of time. But keep feeding in your questions, everybody. Sean's trying to collate and pull them all together so we can ask them to you. So, Ms. Susie Tezazu asks, how can NGOs ad advocate for human rights, like the right to safe water, in countries where human rights are considered the sole responsibility of states? Um, Wahid poses a different question in relation to NGOs, and it's about fraudulent and corrupt practices um, affecting the rights of ordinary people. And earlier on, he you asked about fraudulent NGOs also, and, and what can be done. And then Mark Detman who comes back to the point really of the, the, the last second last question that we asked you about states having obligations, people have duties, and where does the private sector and NGOs fall? Um, over to you, Katerina. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, now on the on the first question, how can NGOs advocate for human rights? like the right to water in countries where human rights issues are considered. Well, the main responsibility is of government. The main responsibility is of states. Um, and I, I think what, that, what NGOs should do is to show governments, well, you have this responsibility, you have this legal obligation, do you manage to do it or not? And, well, maybe you can identify areas where the government is not being able to do everything. And then you can suggest the government, well, you cannot do it uh, by yourself. Would you like our help? Would you accept our help um, to do it? Sometimes I think it can even be uh, good uh, to, well, not to just to explain what you mean. I mean, 
he wants to make sure that everyone gets access to water and sanitation. I know that sometimes when you talk about human rights from the outset, people get afraid. But why don't you say, let's help, we want to help you help people uh, get access to, 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 to water and, uh, and, uh, and sanitation. Regarding the second question, of course corruption affects the rights uh, uh, to water and sanitation. Because as I was saying, if governments have to use their available resources to the maximum, uh, well, they will not be able to use them to the maximum if a part of that money is being used in corrupt practices or fraudulent practices. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, tackling that's why transparency is such an important element and addressing corruption, uh, uh, obviously, too. In a report that I presented last year to the General Assembly where I talked about financing the sector, I addressed these issues and also in the book on good practices that is available on my website, I also address the practices, I give examples of practices that aim at, um, at ensuring budget transparency, etc., etc., budget monitoring, to making sure that uh, corruption is fought uh, against. Now, finally, uh, obligations, duties, uh, uh -huh. the private sector, as I said, has responsibilities. Has responsibilities to making sure that the rights, water, and sanitation are not violated, number one, uh, that no discrimination, for example, is not violated, and also to making sure that, and, and also to ensuring a certain due diligence, to start taking a certain initiative to assess whether what they are um, agreeing to might violate the human right to water and, 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 and sanitation. So it's not duties, it's not obligations, it is something else, it's called responsibilities. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Um, Katrina, the next two questions are related to maintenance. So uh, Robert Butcher uh, asks, um, does this mean that governments, uh, governments have an obligation to maintain or does the obligation, is the obligation with users? In the case of governments, do they have to spend excessive amounts on maintenance and subsidizing operations and this money in national budgets is not available to provide access to the unserved. And as Steph Smith uh, asks, um, do you see a trade-off between the progressive covering of the unserved um, and avoiding um, the retrogression of service? And um, would avoiding retrogression mean avoiding investing in maintaining existing services of the served? And uh, would, that, would that go at the expense of of the answer. So I guess this is, in a nutshell, um, how do you balance maintaining existing systems against extending uh, to the people who don't have services at the moment? Thank you. Um, good. Um, I think that uh, we cannot look at the human right to water and say, well, let, let's say to human right to water. We cannot look at the human right to water as imposing an obligation on states, on every single state, to bring a water tap to every single person in a country. That's not what it means. What the human rights says is that the government has to create an enabling environment in which people can exercise their rights. What does it mean? It means that when someone does not have the means to exercise this right by him herself, for reasons beyond his or her control, because he, she is sick, lost the job, etc., the government has to intervene. In the majority of cases, we know that these are the majority of cases, the government just has to create this in an environment and it is up to us to, uh, to contribute um, to the realization of this rights by paying our water bill, by paying the connection, by keeping, by maintaining, uh, by, 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 by supporting the maintenance of the system. So ideally, uh, we, the, the things should look, um, how should the things look like? Uh, the, the, the system uh, will, we should receive um, uh, financial contributions from those who can pay uh, in, in, that enable uh, the, 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 the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure sorry, to be maintained and also to enable, to subsidize, to help, um, to connect those and to, to ensure access to water and sanitation to those who do not have the needs. 
So I think that this is the situation, uh, the ideal situation. Of course, we know that in certain countries this is difficult because you don't have enough people with resources to contribute to the sector. That's where I think that it is fundamental to think also about um, looking at the budget as a whole, how is the budget being designed, and how does it prioritize human rights, family rights to water, and is the government resorting to international assistance and cooperation? Because uh, uh, resorting to uh, uh, international assistance and cooperation can ensure that we progressively cover the answers and that we avoid, in fact, retrogression. Uh, thank you. These are very difficult challenges for the sector. Next question. We have um, a linked question around sanitation, actually. Um, Nick Chudeo um, from Kenya asks, discussions around the human right to sanitation often focus on public and private infrastructure solutions, but they very seldom focus on environmental or ecosystem approaches, such as environmental sanitation. What role do you think an environmental approach to the global sanitation situation could play? And then John Aleandarius asks, what should be the responsibility of government about access to the basic sanitation in rural areas? And I guess this also relates to the issue of community-led total sanitation. Is that something that fits within the human rights approach? Over to you, Katerina. Thanks, Kirsten. Um... Well, again, the, the responsibility of government, and I'm starting with the second one, uh, regarding access to sanitation, don't say basic sanitation, let's say sanitation, because the human right to sanitation is more than basic sanitation. So, um, uh, for the government to ensure access to sanitation in rural areas, I think that, for example, CLPS is a great example, in my humble opinion. And I've, re I've recommended to government where uh, CLPS has been piloted with the help of UNICEF, I've recommended governments to transform CLPS LTS, community led total sanitation, into a national, a national wide uh, uh, policy because I think it empowers people, it makes people aware of the importance of sanitation, it makes people develop um, appropriate sanitation solutions, uh, etc. So the responsibility is very much, has very much to do with awareness raising. Um, education, but also, obviously, also financing and supporting people uh, uh, who do not have the means uh, to get there. On the first question, well, uh, public-private infrastructures, tell them on environmental uh, approaches, uh, well, uh, I, I think that obviously environmental approaches and on-site uh, sanitation solutions can bring us further in uh, realizing and, uh, and making sure that the right to sanitation is, is, is realized. I think that this is a good uh, is, is, is a good approach that can contribute uh, to, to to helping to in, uh, to be, uh, improving the global sanitation solution. There are obviously other uh, other 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 solutions. I think what is important is to think outside the box, to think about um, uh, small solutions uh, which can be cheap cheap technology, etc. What I often see in, the, in, in, in developing countries is that uh, very often donors provide huge, uh, provide now, prioritize, uh, prioritize um, financial support that goes to huge systems that they cannot maintain, that are not helpful to rural areas, to small places, etc. So we have to rethink uh, sanitation. We also have to make politicians more interested uh, in, in sanitation and more committed uh, to sanitation. I always think that this all uh, always has to do a lot with education and uh, awareness raising, creating the need inside the countries, among the governments, among the people. Over. Great, thank you. Um, the next set of questions, which should have pasted in there, and I don't know why they didn't. Ah, there we go. Uh, we've had uh, several questions about the, the, the context to which uh, human rights uh, is applied. So, Madibo De Debelli asks, uh, can you brief us on the indigenous people's human rights to water and sanitation? Uh, Mahida Tesfu asks, uh, how can we ensure water rights and access for pastoralist communities? 
And uh, Besha in Ethiopia asks, uh, in different city water utility regulations, settlements like slum and squatters have no rights to claim for water and sanitation services. So how do you see this issue with respect to the human rights to water and sanitation? So three, three interesting different contexts there. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Indeed, very, very, very interesting. But I don't have, I don't have an answer, a straightforward answer, uh, on, 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 or at least on the first two issues. The rights of indigenous peoples. Well, can you brief us on indigenous peoples' human rights, water, and sanitation? Well, they, they have the same human rights than we have. Obviously, it's the same. Maybe the challenges can be different. The challenges in having access to water and sanitation, and also the need that they have. Uh, when it comes to water, mainly for cultural practices, might be different. I visited an indigenous tribe in the USA, for example. I've always met with indigenous people in, in, in the country missions that I understood and the two countries where there are indigenous people. Well, and the challenges they face is living in remote areas, not seeing their rights recognized, seeing their uh, lands being expropriated or taken over in order to build a dam, etc. But basically, the legal framework is the same. The legal framework that protects indigenous people's right to water and sanitation is the same that protects our rights to water and sanitation. I don't know if I'm helping anything, but I encourage you to read, for example, my report on the US, my, uh, on the US side. How can we ensure this right to the per, per, uh, pastoralist uh, communities? Well, I don't know. It will depend from country to country to context, from context to context. Um, and again, I, I think that human rights does not impose a solution for pastoralist communities. It will depend on the context, it will depend on their resources, it will depend on the availability of water in the region. Maybe you are talking about a country where it rains a lot. Maybe you are talking about a country where they, which is completely dry. Uh, I'm looking at a photo I have here in my office of a, a tribe in the north of Namibia. They have no water. So the situation for them is different from other situations. So it has to be seen on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. How rich is the country? It has to be seen that way. Uh, so I don't have a, no, a, a generic uh, answer uh, to address your uh, uh, question. I ask you again. Look at my book. I will put. I will uh, write the the the, the, the web address uh, here. Um, I agree uh, fully with the last question. That very often, and I've seen this in my meetings, that it is said uh, that governments tell me. Well, they don't count because they are illegal. I've seen this, for example, in Slovenia with the Roma community. I've seen this in Egypt with slum dwellers, in Bangladesh with slum dwellers, etc., etc., etc. So all over the place, there are also always groups of the population who are invisible to the government. And the government even thinks that they have a legal justification not to bring them the services. Um, the human right, how do I see this issue with respect to the human right to water and sanitation? I see that everyone is a person, everyone is a human being, and every person on earth has a right to water and sanitation. And for human, for, for human rights purposes, the legal status of the land in which people are living, or the nationality, or the passport, or, or the legal status even of the person, is indifferent. Governments have to take measures to make sure that everyone has access to water and sanitation. Full stop. Over. Thank you very much. I mean, for those of you who have not read any of Katerina's country work, I recommend that you do so because it really opens one's eyes onto the excluded, even in developed countries. Um, it's in its the human right to water, as I understand more and more, it's really about access to water with all the criteria forever and access for everyone, um, not just the low-hanging fruit of the easiest to serve. But I'm going to come to a question from Tesfu. Now, Tesfu took part in our e-discussion, and, um, and he pointed out uh, one of the realities that government structures at the lower level are not familiar with the different policies and procedures on the rights to water and that there is a real need to build their capacity on the human right to water for better implementation. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about where you've seen experiences of that happening, or, or maybe even you bounce it back to us, uh, as sector people, and, and 
tell us what you think needs to be done in this regard. Over to you, Katerina. Well, unfortunately, it is true. Uh, my idea is completely true. Uh, and I see it constantly. What can I say? I see it constantly on my country missions. And you are talking about the local level. I would go even further. Uh, it's not only the local level, it's also the central level that is not always familiar with what human rights imply. And I'm not even criticizing governments. In uh, my compil in, in, while compiling with practices, I remember meeting with governments telling me, help us. We want to do it. We don't know how to do it. I don't have infinite capacity uh, to support government, etc. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm, 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 I'm very sorry for that. But uh, what do we have to do? I think that we are all impatient because we want things to move. At least that's how I feel the sector, um, and that's how I feel myself too. Uh, but it is well. What I think that what we need is more education. And well, maybe my question is. How, I think that this seminar, for example, this webinar is a very good example of awareness raising on the rights to water and sanitation. Uh, maybe there is more that can be done. For example, one of the things I was thinking about uh, was to prepare a guide uh, to help uh, uh, people at the national level to support the implementation of, of, of the right. Would this be of help to you? Uh, it's just a question. Uh, other things I am happy to support. Of course, I, I cannot be, I'm one person, I cannot be everywhere. So what would be great would be to develop at the national or even at the regional level the means, training uh, uh, kits, training tools to raise awareness and familiarize people also at the local level about the content of the human rights and what it imply, implies for them in their daily work. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is about Rio Plus 20 and uh, from uh, Thomas Aquabed who asks, is it true that political obstacles with regards to the right to water and sanitation in the Rio Plus 20 ministerial declaration have been removed recently. Thanks. Well, Thomas is a very well-informed man. He knows more than I do. Uh, well, I heard that, um, uh, that I, I don't know what's going on, to be honest. Uh, the last document I saw had the right uh, to water and sanitation in the, the ministerial declarations, but today or yesterday I received an email uh, which was very negative about the, the content, the, about the negotiations in Rio Plus 20. I just, like five minutes before this webinar, I finished an, uh, an article that I'm going to publish in uh, Portuguese speaking countries, uh, in uh, Portuguese speaking newspapers, but also in The Guardian on Rio Plus 20. I wrote an open letter uh, to governments on Rio Plus 20 and this letter was sent to all permanent missions, to all embassies of all UN member states in New York to make sure that they, uh, they incorporate the human right to water and sanitation. The last proposal I saw for a go on water, I have to say, was very bad and did not have uh, any references to, uh, to human rights, to the content of the human rights. Uh, uh, well, what I've heard was that I think the USA had called for the removal of the reference to the human rights to, to water from the declaration. That's the latest I heard. Uh, but maybe Thomas has more information that I had, and I'm happy to receive his information bilaterally or multilaterally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we have an interesting question here. Um, around double standards and the fact the whole issue of um, pollution was raised by a number of participants in the e-discussion, um, particularly looking at the Niger Delta area. Um, and here's a question within this webinar from Modibo Dembele, who says, why do international corporations use double standards in developing countries, especially into the mining area, by polluting drinking water and many health hazards? And, Maybe you can tell us what this human right to water can actually do with respect to pollution of water resources. Um, over to you. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, 
um, uh, you know, I don't know if I told you at the beginning, I received, I, I did, I received complaints from people uh, who are alleged victims of violations of this human right. And uh, if I had made a statistical analysis of the, of the complaints I received, I would easily be able to say that the majority of them regards the mining industry. Uh, pollution of drinking water and health hazards, precisely as is mentioned in the question, uh, caused by the mining, uh, by the mining uh, industry. Um, in those cases, I, I, I send uh, often letters both to the company and to the government. To the company, in order to make sure that the company is respecting human rights, that the company is not violating, promoting the violation of human rights, and that the company is uh, is doing at least no harm to human rights, and of course there is uh, well, if uh, drinking water is polluted, uh, people get sick. Uh, if uh, it is polluted and it will then be clean, it costs money. Then water will be less uh, less affordable. And I also talk with the government because it's up to the government to regulate the sector and also to make sure that the company complies with the human rights standards and with the obligations that have been undertaken by uh, by 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 the government. Uh, over. All right. Thank you. The next two questions are about implementation. So uh, Andre asks, uh, which practical uh, steps can development partners follow to assure that their programs and policies consider the human right to water approach appropriately? And Stephen asks, how can the concept of water and sanitation as a human right be applied to mobilize resources for less favored communities? Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, mm, 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 mm. Well, uh, uh, well, regarding the last question, um, I, I think that the concept of the human right to water uh, and sanitation uh, is ideal to mo mobilize resources for the less favored communities because what the human rights says is that we have to prioritize those who are less favored, those who are left behind. So, um, what do I have, how shall I say, when we compare it with the Millennium Development Goals, the Millennium Development Goals simply, well, simply, between inverted commas, ask us to reduce by half people without access, but the, the MDG framework does not tell us which people, so it can be better off people. Uh, the human rights have precisely the opposite approach, they say, start with the poor, start with the most neglected uh, and that's what it what what non-discrimination what equality means it means uh, positive discrimination it means starting with those who have less means so i think that the human rights framework and the concept and uh, what it means are very powerful to tell governments look this is your obligation look you have to start by rural area X, by slum Y, where people have absolutely been left behind. This is, for example, what I systematically said in my country missions to government. On, on, the, on, on, development, on development partners, I know that, for example, um, um, I think that integrating the human right to water and sanitation, looking at the different uh, elements, quality, availability, accessibility, also no discrimination, etc. Looking at all these elements at the different uh, uh, parts of a project cycle, man, uh, of a project cycle, it would be very interesting. It would force everyone to start uh, asking himself, herself, about what, uh, the impact of the measures they are undertaking, the steps they are taking, the initiatives, uh, 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 etc. And I know that, uh, that um, uh, SCAT with uh, SDC and with WaterLex are developing a practical toolkit which is aimed at giving this practical guidance to partners to making sure that their policies integrate the human right uh, to water and sanitation. And I think that everyone is looking forward to, to working with this toolkit. Thank you very much, Katerina. And indeed, in fact, if you look at the GLASS report already, the, the GLASS report, the global um, assessment of sanitation that, that came out, already many of the questions around the human right to water are being asked. So, so a lot of things are already being incorporated. 
we've still got plenty of questions, but I'm, I'm going to kind of say something else to you, to Katerina. I mean, at the moment, you've got over 70 people online who work in the sector, and maybe something for you to think about is, are there some questions that you'd like to throw back? And, and unfortunately, we can't hear everyone talk, but people can write in the chat box. So if there's something that you'd like to, to throw back and, and ask the audience to, to write, um, that would be useful to, to hear from you. Um, I don't know if you want to do that now, or if we carry on with the questions and we do it maybe in five minutes. Well, how, do, how do you, yeah, over to you, Katerina. Katerina was typing a question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me finish typing a question. <laughs> Give me one second. I, 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 it is already online. Okay, so I'm going to read your question. Um, so basically, Katerina is writing to everyone to say, do you think that a guide for implementing the, the human right to water and sanitation would be helpful? And maybe I'm going to go a little bit further and ask you people who are participating, what would you like to see in such a guide? Yeah, um, to, a, a guide that would really help you to make um, your efforts in... in Plantation of Water for All, the human right to water, a reality. So if you can be typing in, um, what would you like to see in such a guideline? And hopefully I'll see hundreds of people writing their, their ideas, because that can really help to feed in to, to the work that Katerina is doing and has to do within her mandate. And I see that multiple attendees are typing. So while you're typing, I'm going to pose the next question to, to Katerina. Um, and just to let you know, we'll be able to, to see all these chats afterwards. It will be sent out to everybody. So, Katerina, next question, implementation two. Raphael asks, when MDGs were initially defined, the human right to water and sanitation was not passed. Do you think that this human right should be included in future strategies after 2015? And then Nick asks a, a question related is, to which extent do you expect the human right to safe drinking water and sanitation to become a real driver in shaping the future development of water services? Over to you. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, regarding the, the first question, um, yes, it is true that uh, by, at that time we didn't have the human rights. And if I believe this right should be included, well, it must be included in future global strategies after 2015, and I've been working for that. Uh, uh, and, uh, well, I cannot possibly imagine any other uh, solution, any other decision. Uh, and I know that there are many governments supporting this, so I'm confident that this will happen. Regarding the second question, uh, to, but, okay, let me say it, I'm confident that it will happen, but uh, I think that we all have to stay vigilant and we have to make sure that this is truly in included in a future uh, global development uh, uh, strategy. So I think that uh, we cannot just think, oh, the human right has been um, uh, recognized in 2010, so we don't have anything to do. We do. We have to make sure that it is there, because you know very well that if the human right is not explicitly referred to in a future global strategy, and it will not be measured. It will be not. It will not uh, influence national policy making, national legislation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we will fall. We will be risk to fall in the same traps uh, where we find ourselves in uh, uh, right now. Uh, a driver. Well, I hope that it is a driver. And I, I, I think that. Um, well, I don't want to be naive and and. And, and say that uh, that uh, that there will be a revolution in the world because the human right to safe drinking water and say or at least an instant revolution in the world just because these rights were recognized. I think there will be a slow, a silent uh, revolution in in uh, in the world, uh, and um, and I hope also that they will uh, shape future uh, developments. Uh, in uh, in uh, in this area. Thank you. 